Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The season of Epiphany is all about the revelation of who the child born to us at Christmas actually is. And so it always begins with the baptism of our Lord, where God the Father says from heaven above, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. From that point on, Jesus will begin his public ministry, and for the next three years of his earthly life, Jesus will go about fulfilling somewhere between 200 and 400 Old Testament prophecies about what the Messiah will actually do, all to show everyone that he is indeed the Christ, the Savior we've been waiting for. So Jesus will heal the sick and cast out demons. He will show his power over the wind and the wave. He will heal lepers and even raise the dead, just as the prophets said the Messiah would do. But nowhere, as far as I can tell, did those prophets ever tell us that the Messiah would provide party beverages for an emergency in a wedding. Here in our gospel text for today, Jesus turns water into wine in order to provide for those guests at the wedding in Cana. And this is the very first of his miracles. And while the Old Testament prophets have seemingly left out this deed of the Messiah, this very first miracle of our Lord Jesus does reveal quite a bit about our God and Savior. First of all, we see that Jesus gives more. This wedding was not without wine. The hosts did not forget to supply it. They just didn't have enough. Jesus could have simply said, well, that'll just have to do. That's not my problem. But instead, we see that Jesus provides more. Second, we see that Jesus also provides better. Better wine than those guests had before. Better wine than even the master of the feast had tasted at similar gatherings. Had Jesus wanted to remain under the radar, he certainly could have provided a wine equal in quality to what everyone had been drinking before they ran out. But instead, we see that Jesus provides better than they expected. Finally, at the wedding at Cana, we also see that Jesus provides what we don't even know that we need, and that he does so without request. Nobody but Mary had yet realized they had run out of wine. Everyone else was still enjoying the party. But if you read closely, you'll see that Mary doesn't really ask Jesus to do anything about it. She simply informs him that they have run out of wine. She certainly knows her son well enough to know that he probably can't let this need go unprovided for, but she does not command him or even ask Jesus to do anything about it. So we see that Jesus gives without being asked, and he gives even before those guests know that they even have the need. In the same way, Jesus still gives his blessings to us. He still gives more. He still gives better, and he still gives without a request, and often even before we recognize that we have a need. Just think about your own life for a second. How much food do you have at home? More than you could eat today? Tomorrow even? Not what you would like to eat today or tomorrow, but what if you had to eat everything that was in your refrigerator, your freezer, and your cupboards? How long would it last you? What a blessing to have more than we need for today. And how many coats are hanging in your closet? How many of your clothes are nicer than they need to be? How many of them go unworn week after week? What a blessing to also have better than the bare minimum that we require. How many of God's blessings that support this body and life simply go unnoticed by us every day, simply because they are so regular, so consistent, and so reliable, that we really only notice when they're not there, or when they're more expensive to acquire than usual? What a blessing to have a God who provides without our asking, without our knowledge, 
and often even without our thanksgiving. What a blessing it is to have a God who still gives like he gave at that wedding in Cana. Of course, the problem is, is that we really don't care about what we have. We really only care about what we want. You see, the sinful nature in each one of us is such that we take God's blessings for granted, and we want something other, something else, or something that belongs to someone else. The reality is, is that the sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, and tenth commandments all have their root in our own selfishness and our wanting something other than that which God provides, even when what God provides is more, better, and also what we truly need. Instead, we want things our way, on our terms, and according to our own timeline. And we even have the wickedness to get angry with our God when those things don't happen. Thankfully, Jesus isn't like us, and he does not respond to us in kind. He does not take his gifts back when they go unappreciated. He does not withhold his gifts because of what we might have done with them last time. No, he simply gives and gives and gives some more. And he still gives more and better and always what we really need because that's just who Jesus is. Even if you don't have all the earthly blessings that you think that you need, God has given you a gift that puts all the riches of this world to shame. For he has taken all your selfishness, all your covetousness, all your greed, all your thievery to the cross, and there he has atoned for it. He has made it right. He has washed it away, forgiven it all. He has undone its power over you. Jesus has given you the very treasures of heaven. He has given you eternal life. He has given you everlasting salvation, and he has given you all provision and all joy. And all of it is gift, simply because he wants to give it. And he gives it to you over and over and over again, more and more, better than you can imagine, more than you can even need. Jesus pours into your cup day after day after day. That's the kind of God that you have. That's the kind of Savior that's yours. That's the Jesus that you love, and that's the Jesus that loved you first. It's no surprise, then, that this revelation of who Jesus is takes place in the context of a lovey and dovey wedding. For much of the scriptures describe a relationship with God as a marriage, or at least how a marriage should be. So I'm going to do something different today that I've never done before, because it seems like the very best place to talk about something this important. Straight up, I'm going to give you dating advice from the pulpit. I realize that not all of you may be in that boat, but stick with me because godly marriages benefit us all, and there's something here for everyone. If you were to ask godly people who are happily married, they will most likely tell you that their marriage is a true gift from God, that their spouse is a gift from God, a gift that is more and better than they expected, and in many cases, a partner that they didn't even know that they needed. And so if you are single, looking to be married, look for someone who shares your faith. Make it a priority absolutely non-negotiable. For there is far and away no better thing that you can do for your long-term happiness, security, and stability than to find a godly spouse. I don't mean someone who went to church as a kid or who sort of believes in Jesus. I mean someone who knows and passionately believes in Jesus and who religiously attends worship without coercion and without nagging. And if you are looking for that, you should be that. Also, leave sex out of dating. I know that's contrary to everything that the whole world is telling you, but there is wisdom and blessing in God's commandment. 
There is wisdom and blessing in following the example of Mary and Joseph and countless others. And so wait for marriage. Live your faith. And don't buy the lies that the world is trying to tell you. A passionate and lively faith will be attractive to those who have a passionate and lively faith. So be that person yourself. Be what you are looking for in others and don't compromise. To that end, place yourself in those places where others who share your faith and values might be found. That means that your best match may not be that hottie you saw at school or work or on a screen somewhere, but rather might be the person sitting in the next pew or who goes to the other church service or who might be at that youth event that you're thinking about attending. There are indeed a lot of fish out there in the sea, but that sea is a cesspool. So maybe you want to exhaust the Lutheran puddles and ponds before you venture out there into the big bad world. Associate with those who share your faith, your values, and your morality, and maybe God will match you up together. Finally, parents, grandparents, start praying now that your children, your grandchildren, anyone that you care about will find a godly spouse and work and encourage them toward that goal. Let's hope and help them find a faithful husband or wife so that they may be blessed by Jesus the same way that couple in Cana was blessed, with more than they could expect, better than they can imagine, and with a gift that only God can provide. For godly marriages benefit us all. For all of us, the wedding at Cana reveals that we have a Savior who simply loves to give, even when we don't recognize it, even when we don't give thanks for it, even when we continue to want something different, he still provides. Jesus turns water into wine to show us that we have a Savior who gives what we truly need and that his gifts are sweeter than we expected, more abundant than we deserve, and more everlasting than we can even imagine. Thanks be to God. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ, our only hope in this life and the next. Amen.